Hello, this is Matthew, and welcome to part three in our video series on IBM Power Servers. Uh, in this part, we are going to create our first partition for an operating system, and we will install Linux into that partition. So we'll see how that process works. Uh, if you missed parts one and two, as a quick recap, in part one, we had our new to us Power7 server. We got it all reset into a nice clean factory default configuration. And we then formatted and created our RAID logical volumes that we wanted uh, available to our operating system. And then in part two, we installed the virtual IO server and it's uh, included integrated virtualization manager. That is going to be our primary or our control partition that owns most of the system hardware and is able to share it with all of the other partitions, uh, or you may think of them as virtual machines that are going to be running on this system. So now we're ready to go ahead and create our first partition uh, that isn't just that base uh, hardware owning partition uh, running Vios. So I'll log into our integrated virtualization manager. Uh, you can see that we currently just have that one control partition. Uh, this is where Vios itself is installed and it owns all of the hardware of the machine. And from here, we just want to go ahead and set up a partition that we'll install Linux into. So an important point of uh, the Power 7 processor is that it is a big Indian architecture processor. Uh, the big end of numbers come first in memory words. So the way that we as humans write uh, numbers on paper, where the most significant digit or the most significant byte of a multi-byte uh, value, a word in memory, comes first and you work toward writing the lowest significant value or byte uh, versus the little Indian system, which uh, has pretty much taken over the world successfully, uh, being the system that's used by Intel and AMD x86 type processors, it puts the least significant byte first, and then you work your way up to the most significant byte. So it's sort of opposite of how we would write numbers. It's like if you were writing the number 5,251, you'd write 1525. Is that the reverse of the digits that I said? <laughs> Something like that. You get the idea. Uh, nonetheless, network byte order remains big Indian, but in terms of processor architectures that are still truly alive today. Um, sadly, we we must consider Spark dead. Um, that was one of the big, big, big Indian architectures. Um, power after Power 7, Power 8 and later are by Indian, meaning that the processor knows how to operate on either big Indian or little Indian byte order. Um, and that allowed the major Linux distros for the most part to uh, quickly abandon PowerPC Big Indian and just build distributions for PPC64 Little Indian, uh, or as it's often referred to, PPC64 EL, which now that I think about it might actually be a play on the fact that with Little Indian, the least significant byte comes first. So you put the E before the L, even though us as humans would say LE. Um, I don't know if that's actually why it's EL, but that makes sense. That just occurred to me. Uh, so the, uh, again, the main Linux distributions for PPC 64, um, sadly have abandoned big Indian support, uh, that is required for our power seven. If you're on a power eight or power nine or power 10, you can just download the latest official Debian or red hat or any of the big Linux distros. Uh, but we're on a power seven. So we need to worry about whether our distro still has big Indian support. And sure enough, uh, if we look for Debian ports, while the official supported Debian uh, PPC64 distribution is only PPC64 EL now, uh, there is a PowerPC64 uh, classic, sort of the big Indian uh, distribution that's still built for Debian. So all the packages are still built for it. And I'm just going to grab the latest snapshot, I think, uh, which was built on December 9th, 2022. 
And sure enough, we can download the Debian 11 PVC64 as opposed to 64EL uh, network install ISO. So let's download that. Uh, interestingly, if you look for OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, uh, this is OpenSUSE's rolling release distribution. I'm not sure if the other OpenSUSE distros still support Power Big Indian. Um, but if you go to download here, they have both Little Indian, uh, as you'd expect from any current Linux distro, and they still have a current PowerPC Big Indian distribution. I've tried this on my Power 7 box under uh, Power VM, and it just gets in a boot loop in the installer. Um, there might be boot flags that you can set to get around it. I don't know what the problem is, um, but I'm a Debian guy, so rather than really try and dig in and troubleshoot that, uh, I just always return to Debian for all of my servers. Okay, so that CD image downloaded. Uh, what we want to do is add this to our virtual CD library so that we can use our virtual CD-ROM drive in the partition we're going to create. Now, in this case, it's a relatively small ISO. It's below the two gigabyte limit that this web interface lets you add. Uh, but for the purposes of showing you how to do this, if you have a CD or in this case, it'd have to be a DVD if it's over than two gigabytes. But if you have a, an ISO image that's over two gigabytes, uh, you can't just upload it through the web interface here. So I've gotten in the habit of always using the uh, Vios shell interface. I just SCP the ISO files up to pAdmin's home directory, and then there's a command to add them to the virtual image repository. So let's do that. Uh, I'm going to move that downloaded Debian file. Was it just called Debian? Yep. Um, to this power directory just to keep everything tidy. And we can just SCP this up to our uh, Vios server. So it's always going to be the pAdmin user as usual. And our Vios server is at 192.168.42.43, just like we pull up in the web browser to get to the IVM, give it our password. All right, so that just immediately closed the connection on SCP. I'm using a very uh, recent, is it, is it capital V, uh, if I could type. Um, I'm using the current version of OpenSSH and starting in, I think OpenSSH 9, uh, they deprecated the old method that SCP uses, and I believe SCP now just uses SFTP for transfer behind the scenes. Um, there are some flaws and problems with how SCP worked. So uh, older SSH servers, like we have in AIX, um, the customized AIX distribution that runs Vios, don't agree on what protocol SCP is supposed to use relative to the newest versions of OpenSSH. So there is a command line uh, flag for SCP, which is just dash capital O, which probably stands for old. And then that will use the old SCP protocol, which should still be compatible with uh, all SSH servers. So we'll try that again. Yep, sure enough, that's working. These older generation power servers aren't speed demons, by the way. Um, just everything from their I.O. throughput to processor speed is not going to be comparable to recent or even not that recent Intel and AMD processors. Um, so just be prepared for things like SCP transfers to go a little bit slower than you may be used to over a local gigabit network. But with that uploaded to our Vios server, let's go ahead and SSH to it. So 192.168.42.43 again. Oops, and uh, the P admin user. And you can see we have that file here in our home directory. Uh, now, in the previous video, when we installed Vios and IVM, we created our CD uh, virtual media repository. And so it's empty right now. If we use the command ls rep, 
it lists our repository and you can see that it is uh, 25 gigs. All 25 gigs are free. It lives in our root volume group under AIX's volume management, uh, which in total is a nearly 400 gigabyte volume. So that all aligns with what we'd expect. And there's nothing in it yet. There's a make vopt command, mkvopt. So if I say help make vopt, uh, this allows us to create virtual optical disks in the virtual DVD repository. So this is what we need to do to copy this file in our home directory into that virtual uh, DVD repository that we previously created. So it takes a name, which is what we want the name in the media repository to be. Uh, and it's a, there's a very limited, uh, it's a restricted environment in terms of what you can name these things. I don't think you can have periods. Um, there's a length limit that is reasonably short. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. Um, so I just tend to use simple names when I put the images in the media repository. And then we can give it a file, which is our source file. So that's the ISO file in our home directory here that we want to copy. And we can tag it as a read-only disk, which I usually do when we're dealing with CD DVD images. So we can enter make vopt. I'm just going to name this Debian 11. Um, I think it's actually a snapshot of Bookworm, the next release, but um, doesn't really matter one way or the other. We will say read-only. And then the file will just be that file name of the ISO image that we want to copy into the repository. So I'll hit enter there. Should copy it reasonably quickly. It's a small file. Sure enough, it did. Uh, we can remove our ISO image from our home directory. We don't need it anymore. Now, if we LS rep, you'll see that we're using some space. Um, but importantly here, you can see our Debian 11 image. And uh, optical none, this just means it's not currently attached to any virtual optical drives. Um, so we'll create our partition and mount this image in the partition's DVD drive. So, so far, so good. Let's go back to our IVM here. And uh, now's when the fun part begins. Um, so we'll create a partition, again, from sort of the VMware world that most of us are familiar with. Uh, this is sort of like creating a VM. There are technical differences behind the scenes in terms of this is really carving out a slice of hardware um, at the machine's physical hardware hypervisor level, uh, sorry, firmware level. Um, but for our practical purposes, especially because we're using VIOS to share resources, uh, it's very much like VMware uh, allowing us to share the host's resources with the uh the VMs. So I'll just call that Debian. Um, this is AIX or Linux. Again, so this is going to present itself as a uh, Chirp common hardware reference platform power PC system, uh, relatively open standards uh, using what's called open firmware as the BIOS, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, versus the totally, totally proprietary, very different enumeration and presentation of hardware to the operating system. Uh, incredibly different boot process that the IBM I world uses that uh, derives from the old dedicated proprietary uh, AS400 hardware and then the I series hardware before uh, IBM merged the product lines and just includes the special IBM I style firmware uh, on their P series or their power uh, servers in addition to the common hardware reference platform power PC firmware. So yeah, AIX or Linux. Uh, our system has 64 gigs of RAM. Let's give this partition um, 16 is more than enough for a Linux system that we're not really going to run any real world workloads on. I'll just give it four. Uh, we're using shared processors. So we may as well let it use all of the processing power of the machine when there aren't other partitions competing for processor usage. You can dedicate processors to VMs or partitions, um, but shared is fine. And then I think I mentioned in the last video that for every processor you assign to a VM, um, it does actually dedicate and allocate one-tenth of a real processor to that VM. 
Um, so there is a limit to the number of VMs or partitions you can have that are sharing uh, those shared processor resources. But uh, that's why you'll end up seeing we, we have 36 available virtual processors because um, the uh, the actual VIOS partition, our control partition, is using four, there it is, four shared processors, um, which uses one-tenth of each of the real four processors. Uh, so essentially you have 40 shared processor, I don't know, slots available if you want to call it that, four of which are already used. We're going to use another four for this. Um, more detail than perhaps you need to know, but that's that's why you see that 36 available thing out of our four real processors. Virtual Ethernet. In the previous video, we mapped each of our virtual Ethernet interfaces to one of the physical Ethernet ports on our quad port Ethernet controller. Um, the only one that has a network cable plugged into it right now is one. So uh, we'll just have one adapter, one virtual Ethernet adapter in this Linux partition, and it is mapped to port number one on that real physical card. Here's where we deal with the disks, the storage for the partition. Uh, you can create it with no storage, and that may be the case if you're actually mapping through a fiber channel card or if you're using the uh, virtual fiber channel and providing your storage from a fiber channel SAN. If you have existing storage resources or virtual disks that you want to assign to it, you can do that. But in our case, we're just going to create a virtual disk. Uh, back to the VMware analogy, this option is the most analogous to VMware, where you're simply creating a VMDK file in VMware speak um, on the VMware server's storage to present to the guest as a disk. Uh, in this case, it's going to create a logical volume in our AIX uh, volume manager volume group. So the closest analogy is probably using a ZVOL on a ZFS zpool as your virtual disk for the guest operating system. So as you said, create virtual disk. It'll give us a default name, uh, logical partition 2, which 2 is going to be the number of this partition. 1 is already used by the control partition. Uh, and then virtual disk 1. I'm fine with that name. We only have one storage pool that we've created, our root volume group. And uh, I mean, 32 gigs is going to be more than enough for a Linux partition that we're not doing a whole lot with. Um, of course, you can create additional virtual disks or attach additional physical disks or whatever you want um, so that you can have multiple disks attached to your Linux instance if you need to add more storage or dedicated storage for a database instance, something like that. And now the virtual optical device. Um, so we'll create a virtual optical device in the server, and we can actually preload that Debian 11 ISO image in that optical drive. So given that there's no operating system on the hard drive yet, uh, if we boot this machine, it should just automatically boot unattended off of um, that Debian installation CD. Next, we'll take us to the summary. We can just verify everything that we've entered and go ahead and hit finish to create our first additional partition. And just like that, we have a partition. Not activated, so it shut down. 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, pretty much of all the resources we've assigned to it, the memory is the only hard partition at the hardware level where you can see the memory available on our overall system has now been reduced to 38.5 because this is 16 gigabytes of dedicated memory to this partition. Um, and that's carved out as long as the partition is created, whether it's running or not. Um, so again, that's a little bit different than VMware, where you could have tons of VMs that are turned off with huge memory allocations, and they don't start using their memory until you power them up. Whereas we have actually sliced this physical server a little piece of the pie out for another uh, partition. And memory is one of those things where the way that we're managing things, um, not using some advanced shared memory stuff, um, is one of the hardware resources that we actually 
include in the slice of the pie on the server that we've carved out for this partition. If you click on it, you can edit most of the stuff after the fact, uh, whether it be storage, the Ethernet settings, processing, memory. Uh, one thing of note, by default, it will enable that this partition automatically starts when the system starts. I typically turn that off. I'm not running production workloads where if the system reboots, it's important that everything comes back up as quickly as possible. Uh, this is a hobbyist machine for non-commercial learning purposes. So I tend to like to power on the physical machine and then just power up the partitions that I want to use for whatever it is that I'm playing with that day. Um, so I'll turn off automatically start when the system starts. And everything else, right, boot mode is just like the physical hardware. We can tell it a normal boot. We can tell it to stop at system management services. Uh, we have the key lock position, normal and manual. That controls some boot attributes of particularly AIX and IBM I. Um, it has its own virtualized attention LED, which you can turn off or on, but usually you turn it back off if something happened that activated the system's attention LED. Um, so it is a fully virtualized power system uh, running in its own partitioned off area of our physical hardware. Now, we don't have a monitor or keyboard plugged into this partition. Uh, so to install Linux, we need access to the serial console, and we will install it that way. Now, of course, in the previous videos, we connected with the physical serial cable to the actual serial port on the back of our Power 720 server, but that serial port is assigned to the operating system uh, that is the first partition that we start, the control partition. So uh, that doesn't all of a sudden become our Debian console when we power up the Debian partition. The serial console is something else that we can virtualize through Vios. So if we go back and we are currently, we're still SSH'd into our Vios machine. Um, and actually I created another screen session for this. So let's actually just go over to our Vios virtual terminal. We'll SSH to Vios again. Uh, there's only one CD for the Debian uh, install, but I'm keeping our other Vios session open just in case we wanted to swap CDs or add a new CD to the image repository, something like that. Uh, whereas this virtual terminal session is going to be our virtual serial terminal plugged into this partition. Uh, so that's the make VT command. We'll open a virtual terminal session and you just have to give it a partition ID. So that was partition ID two. So all I need to say here is make vt id2, and now I'm sitting at a uh, essentially serial console connection to the serial port of partition two. The way I get out of that, oh, sorry, this is our old window from a previous video. We can close that. Uh, the way I get out of that is tilde period, but Keep in mind, I'm SSH'd into the Vios server, and tilde period is the SSH escape sequence to kill the SSH session. So I don't want to kill my whole SSH session into the Vios server. I just want to send tilde period to this make VT virtual um, serial session on the Vios server itself. So I'm just going to enter here because these things need to be preceded by a carriage return. So to escape the tilde in SSH, I type it twice. So I'm going to type tilde tilde period and that disconnects my virtual terminal session but i'm still ssh'd into the vios server um, so hopefully that makes sense basically any time at the start of a line immediately after a carriage return if you're typing a tilde in an ssh session you need to type it twice to escape it so we'll just connect back to that virtual serial console um, right the partition is not turned on yet so i can type whatever I want and nothing happens because I've just plugged a serial cable essentially into a turned off machine. So let's turn it on. Hit the check mark next to that partition and say activate and confirm that you want to activate it. And you'll see here that just like when we powered on the physical machine, we had reference codes printed out on that little uh, display for virtual uh, or for partitions, they each have their own little display, and you can see what is on it through 
this console here. You can also click on it to get a history, and anytime you hit go, it'll refresh to the latest. But it's kind of nice because you can actually select them, and for quite a few of the codes, it actually knows what they are. So you can see a description of them. Create aliases, nodes, and system aliases. That's hardware enumeration type stuff. Initialize console. Um, you can see here we're on dynamic console selection. Um, so it's kind of nice to be able to go through there and actually see all of the random stuff that it's doing during that IPL process. But dynamic console selection means it's waiting for us to um, do something at the console. And in fact, it already selected this as the console, so it's going ahead. And sure enough, welcome to Grub. So it is booting off of that Debian installation CD. Um, I tend to like to do expert installs of Debian just so that I can set uh, the static IP address during installation. And I suspect there is currently a problem with the Debian ports snapshots um, having an out-of-date GPG key for the ports repositories, which will be easier to fix, I think, from an expert install. So we're going to do an expert install. I often notice that uh, when the Linux kernel first boots on this Power 7 box, or in fact, even on my Power 8 box, um, it, yeah, it actually reboots back to Grub once. I'm not sure if it's doing some kind of processor reconfiguration or something where it actually needs to change the state of the uh, partition and reboot to get everything right so that it can work. But it rebooted. I'm just going to choose expert install again. And this time, I suspect it should work just fine. Yeah, here we go. So now it booted just as you'd expect. All right, so now we're in the Debian uh, expert installer. So you just get a lot more menu options that you run through. Uh, we want English, US, US, that's fine. I don't need any additional locales. I don't need to use a Braille display, uh, American English keyboard, mount the installation medium. Great, so it found our, uh, indeed this is SID, so this is Debian unstable because we grabbed the latest snapshot. Uh, PPC64, netinst, perfect. That is our CD. Load the components. Uh, you can, if you wanted to SSH remote install here, you could choose the appropriate module, but we'll just do it the simple way. So I will just continue without any uh, anything but the defaults. You can see the color map here is a little bit messed up, but that's okay. Detect our network hardware. It should find our one virtual Ethernet device. And here we'll configure the network. I'm not going to use DHCP. We will give it a static address. Let's see, we've used 42, we've used 43. So I guess 44 is the next one in sequence. Gateways.1 and my name server is actually dot seven. And I have a backup name server in my home network at dot two. Yeah, so the interface is called IBM VE4. It's just the number that's assigned to it. That's fine. We'll say, yes, that's correct. Uh, hit enter here. Okay, host name. I'm going to call this P7 Debian for Power 7 Debian. Uh, we'll put it in my home.mattwilson.org domain. Great. Instead of our default user, yes, we want shadow passwords. We'll allow root login with a password. All right, I'll also create my normal user account. Okay, so just typical Debian installation stuff. Really nothing different here now that we're in the partition, booted the installer. Um, you can't even really tell its power. Uh, the clock, yeah, we'll synchronize with NTP. Sure, we'll use the Debian NTP pool aliases. I'm in Pacific time. Disks, we should see our virtual, uh, what do we make, 64 gig disk here, partition it. Uh, I'll just have it auto partition the entire disk. 
And here you can see the Linux kernel actually has a uh, kernel module for virtual DASD, uh, AIX virtual DASD. So it's like um, if you use KVM virtualization on Linux, you can use um, vert.io, which is an optimized, right? It's not emulating an IDE or a SATA controller. It's actually uh, optimized for VMs. Uh, and you have to have driver support in the guest operating system. Same sort of deal here where these virtual DASDs uh, are optimized in a way where they have basically very, very little overhead from virtualization. Uh, and the Linux kernel supports that. So that's why it's showing up as this AIX vDASD because Linux actually fully understands uh, this environment that we're running in. All partitions in one, that's fine. And it looks like it's going to create a gig of swap. Uh, 30, okay, yeah, so what, how big did we make the disk? We made it 36 gigs. Yeah, so uh, we end up with 33 gig root. That's all fine. I'll just accept all the defaults here and write them to disk. Okay, install the base system. This will just copy some of the basic stuff over to our hard drive. Okay, we'll select the generic kernel package, not a version specific kernel package. This way we'll just get kernel updates um, through the meta package. And this is talking about generic or not in it RD. Uh, we'll just accept the defaults here. All right, configure the package manager. Uh, no additional installation media. We will use a network mirror. Um, cause of course this was just a small net inst CD, so it doesn't have, uh, even a lot of the basic packages we'd want to install. Uh, we'll use an HTTP mirror. If you just enter information manually, uh, it's actually pre-populated with the default Debian ports mirror archive. Again, this is not a, uh, official Debian platform that's supported by the main Debian project anymore. So we can't use the normal Debian mirrors. We need to use one of the ports directories on the mirrors that carry the Debian ports archives. Uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and use non-free software. Why not? And sure, we'll take source repositories as well. Okay, so this problem actually has nothing to do with power, nothing to do with power VM or VIOS. Um, this is actually a Debian ports problem where I think the old ports signing key, in fact, let me switch over to the, uh, what would that be? Control A, A4. Yeah. So the old ports signing key, I think expired, um, at the end of 2022. And so there's a new Debian ports archive signing key for 2023. Uh, however, if you noticed when we downloaded the image, this last snapshot was generated still back in 2022, and I don't think they've incorporated knowledge of the new key into it yet. Um, this doesn't happen with the real official Debian installers, but uh, I think they just didn't quite plan for this far enough ahead of time toward the end of the year snapshots um, for these unofficial ports that are still maintained. So we can fix this. Uh, let's go back back to the installer and I'm going to say go back and we actually need to do some work in a shell where we can edit the apt configuration files. Um, so again, I guess you could say that this is a problem related to this being power seven because I'm having to use these sort of unofficial uh, Debian ports and not the main supported Debian PowerPC64 Little Indian distribution, which would not have this problem. Um, but this isn't really a PowerPC problem. This is a Debian ports problem. So no problem. We can fix it. Um, so our target installation is mounted in this target directory. So you can just go into the apt uh, configuration here. And if we look in... Where do I want to do this? Let's do it in apt-conf D. And I don't think we have VI installed in this. Yeah, I'm going to have to use nano as much as it pains me. Let's just make a file called 99 um, unsecure. 
Because what we're going to do is tell the system that we want to um, ignore repository and package signing if we have to. So I th think, uh, let me just confirm the syntax of this file if we look at uh, 70 devconf. Okay, yeah, so it's... Uh, yeah, so it's the apt option and then space the value and semicolon. So we need to add lines here to say things like acquire, allow insecure repositories. I think it's plural like that. Yep, that's going to be true. And acquire... Allow downgrade to insecure repositories is true. And then finally, we'll say apt get allow unauthenticated is true. I think that's all we need. I'm just looking at notes over on my laptop here from, um, I actually run into this, ran into this the other day, installing a, a Debian ports install on a different system. So that's why I have already troubleshooted this problem and was expecting it. Um, but this will allow us to use those repositories, even though we don't currently have the signing key on this, um, on this distribution media. So I think that should work. Let's save that. And if we just exit from the shell here, we can resume, uh, yeah, the stuff we left off to configure the package manager. Uh, okay. And yes, network mirror, HTTP, accept all the defaults. Yes, allow non-free. Yes, enable source packages. There we go. Okay, so now it's accepting the data from this repository. Uh, it should go without saying that obviously disabling all package signing and getting this over an HTTP connection completely destroys your ability to verify the provenance of all the software installing this Debian install. Um, that's not the point of this video. Obviously, they need to um, spin a new uh, uh, snapshot with the new 2023 key, um, or there may be other ways to import that key. Um, although... The GPG commands aren't available from the boot root of this, so I'm actually not sure how you'd do that. But this was the way I figured out: is basically just disable security. Obviously, take that approach under careful advisement. But we'll move on because we're talking about installing in a PowerVM partition and not a uh, deep examination of installing Linux in particular. Okay, so it's downloading all. It doesn't look like it'll take too long. Um, it's just grabbing a bunch of the base packages from the online app repository. Okay, prompting us about the automatic update tools. We'll say no automatic updates. I'll handle those uh, myself. So whenever I'm using Debian on a non-x86 system, I always turn on the package survey tool, um, right? So this is a little uh, analytics uh, telemetry package that gets installed, but uh, I think it's really important that when we're running these non-x86 systems that we're sending the data back to the Debian project showing, um, you know, not only the specific packages that we use so they can prioritize keeping those working and up-to-date and bug-free, but just the fact that, yes, this is a platform people are using Debian on. So please keep supporting. I know they've already officially dropped support for PowerPC64 Big Indian, but, um, you know, please keep supporting these alternative platforms. No desktop environment. Uh, yes, we want the SSH server. Yes, we'll take standard system utilities. That looks good to me. All right, that's all the software installed. We can now install the bootloader. It says this computer is configured to boot via EFI. Um, I think that may be how the 
PowerPC open firmware stuff looks to Linux. There may be similarities between them. Uh, it's asking as a workaround if we need to install, uh, blah, 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 whatever. You just say no here. Um, the IBM Power server does not have a buggy uh, implementation of its firmware boot process. So that's it. We'll select finish the installation. It does a little bit of last minute cleanup. Uh, is the system clock set to UTC? Yes, it is. And we will just say uh, continue to reboot here. And again, we're still uh, connected to this partition through its serial virtual serial console. <laughs> but you'll see that between the terminal assumptions of the Debian installer and the terminal assumptions of the uh, Vios virtual terminal emulator, and then whatever terminal assumptions are going on in GNU screen and in my outer X term window, uh, it's a bit messed up and that we only have a couple of lines of viewable space. So what we need to do is I'm going to do tilde tilde period to disconnect from the virtual terminal. I'm going to exit from BIOS. I'm going to run the reset command on my Linux system here just to get the terminal emulation back to a clean state. Uh, and then I can reconnect to BIOS and I can reconnect to the serial port. And uh, where are we? Okay, so it's in the boot process here. Let's see if we actually ended up booting from the hard drive and not the CD again. Yeah, 6105 uh, is the kernel we installed. I think that's that's newer than the kernel that was on the boot CD. So uh, it looks like we're all good. It installed and it is now all set to just automatically boot off of our virtual hard drive. Perfect. Yeah, P7 Debian. That was the system name we gave it. Uh, so we don't need to use this serial terminal anymore. So tilde tilde period again to get out of it. And uh, we're done with BIOS here. Let's rename this session to... Uh, we'll just call it Debian, and we should be able to SSH using that user that we created in the installer to our new system. 192.168.42, what were we up to? 44? Yep. Perfect. So we're in. We have a working installed Linux system for PowerPC64 under our... IVM partition. If I refresh this, uh, so it just prints Linux PPC64 um, as the final reference code once it's IPL'd, which is kind of nice. You can see what operating system's running. Um, it's been up for 2.5 minutes. That was that last reboot after the installer finished. And then you can see how much processing power it's using. This is averaged over some period of time, um, but as you refresh here, uh, you can see that now that it's sort of booted and idle, it's down to basically zero. And that's it. I'm not sure that there's really anything else we need to look at here. Uh, we've accomplished our goal of installing a Linux partition on our Power 7 box. Um, if you look at, you know, the disks, as we'd expect, uh, DevSDA is our virtual disk. At this point, it's just a Linux box. There's not a lot of differences on Linux between the different platforms. That's one of the nice things about Linux. Um, obviously, you need binaries that work for power. If we check, um, you know, user bin ls, all of our binaries are still ELF, um, but they are built for 64-bit PowerPC or Cisco 7500. I wonder what processor Cisco 7500s use. Power ELF v1 ABI. Uh, yeah. 64 bit. Cool. So one of the things we haven't really covered before is shutting this all down. Uh, so the way I like to do it is to first cleanly shut down any of the uh, other partitions using their operating system tools. So you can just click shut down here. And if you do 
um, a delayed shutdown, this will actually send like the equivalent of the ACPI power button press, which should cleanly shut down Linux. Um, but I, like I said, I just like to do it from the operating system itself. So since I'm SSH'd into my Debian box, uh, I'll just say sudo shutdown dash H now. Oh, we actually didn't install sudo. So um, because we made we made it so that you can log in as root and we gave root a password, uh, it didn't install sudo by default. But of course, you can just... Um, install sudo yourself there we go and then you'd set it up to put your user in a group or give a user permission um, but since we're root we'll just go ahead and shut down dash h now and that will shut down pretty quickly if i refresh here yep it's already not activated it shut down um, so i th think you can shut down the uh, IVM partition from here. It'll shut down the entire system, including the running partitions, make sure everything else is shut down first, gives the option to restart, and um, that will actually shut off your hardware server. But the way I tend to do it is by uh, SSHing. So I'm already SSHed into BIOS here, but we can connect again just so you're clear what we're doing. Uh, I SSH as P admin into the virtual IO server. And then from here, there's a shutdown command uh, where you can also give it that restart option. So if I just say shutdown, warns me it could affect client partitions, of course. Uh, we've already shut down all our client partitions. I'll just say yes here. And then this will begin shutting down the virtual IO server. And when it's fully shut down, our machine will actually physically turn off. So if you pull back up the 192.168.42.42, which is our service processor, this one's admin, not p admin. And you can see the power state is still on. If I pop up the system information and our uh, real-time progress indicator. So again, this lets us look at that little uh, front panel of the machine. Once AIX shuts down, which it's still in the process of doing, um, you'll see that the machine itself goes through a number of reference codes for its actual shutdown process. And it will eventually turn itself off. We'll get back to this idle display um, on the little progress indicator. Yeah, so here we go. So basically, AIX has finished its shutdown now, and it has sent the power the power off signal to the physical machine. And like everything else with these power servers, it will take a little bit of time to actually go through that process cleanly and shut itself off. Uh, so if we just go to another page and come back to power on off, Yep, so it's still on. I was kind of curious what it's doing in these cases, so I often will just go ahead and search for reference codes. Um, if you don't get an exact hit, then yeah, it's the one that IBM may not document that particular exact step. Really, these are servers that are meant to be turned on once and then never shut down again. <laughs> it would be a very, very rare... Uh, event for an IBM power server to be shut down once it's deployed and put into production. So startup and shutdown time isn't a huge concern. Um, they're much more interested in performing extensive tests, particularly on power up, um, but then even on shutdown, just I think getting all of the internal state and all the partition information, uh, resetting all of the hardware so that it's in a zeroed out state and ready to go for the next power on. Uh, so you can just see it's working through the steps here to actually turn off the hardware. Okay, so if we just refresh that page. Okay, so it is showing us off now. So the power is off. Um, at this point, we're basically just waiting for the service processor to get itself back to a state where it's ready to uh, 
power the system back up again if that's what you wanted to do. Yeah, and there we go. So, okay. Yeah, there. So now it's probably going to settle and we're stable on that um, firmware standby state where the machine is powered off but idle, uh, just waiting for the command to power back up. Which I will go ahead and do to get us ready for our next video. Um, so again, at this point, you can just push that little white power button on the front of the machine because we have all of our auto start continued operating system, normal boot options uh, actually saved here. But usually these machines would be in a data center. You don't have quick physical access to just walk over to it and press the button. Um, so I'll just press the power on button from the remote management interface. And that'll power it back up again. And it will be ready for us to do part four of this video series, which is going to be what uh, I think many of you have been waiting for, or certainly haven't seen before, which is installing IBM I. Um, that's probably going to be a pretty long video, even by my standards. Uh, maybe if I just fast forward through all the slow parts, it may actually just be a normal length video for me, um, meaning one to one and a half hours. But uh, that should be fun. Um, like I said, probably something that versus, say, a Linux install or even just the concepts of partition or virtual machine management um, is perhaps uh, something that a lot of you have never seen before. IBM I is certainly a very, very, very different operating system. So its installation process is just as different as the rest of the operating system once it is installed. So we'll have the system booted back up and ready to go uh, for the next video. If you're watching these live as they come out, the next video will be tomorrow morning. Uh, but if you're watching these after the fact, I will have gone back and updated uh, with links to all of the parts of the video series in the description below. So feel free to subscribe if you want to see when the new videos come out. Otherwise, Feel free to leave a comment if you have any questions, uh, any feedback on how I make these videos, any comments, stories from your time using power systems in production or otherwise. I always love to hear from you and uh, see that people are actually enjoying these videos. So I appreciate your watching these so much. And until next time, have a good one.